Hello everyone and welcome to your Week on Chain report for week 30. I'm your host Checkmate and we're recording this on the 27th of July 2021. So this week started out with what appears to be a short squeeze that has pushed the market relatively higher and it's come off the back of a period of, of volatility expectations in the options market. We've seen a large amount of call and puts being bought out of the money, um, particularly one month out starting to show that there's some expectation of volatility and explosive move out of this long-term consolidation range, which we've been in for about two and a half months. We also started to see options uh, and futures open interest really starting to climb. So it was suggesting that there was the potential for a bit more leverage to get squeezed out of the system. So what we're going to look at this week is the market structure that led into that short squeeze. We're going to look at some of the changes in positioning of those derivative markets that have happened in the last 24 hours, and also just some things to be paying attention to as we, uh, as we move on through the week. And then we're also going to look at a little bit of a divergence that's going on in the on-chain activity. So what we really want to look at is, are we seeing the on-chain momentum? Are we seeing people settling value and demand for block space, justifying and following through on this rally? Or is this simply a derivative short squeeze and it actually doesn't have the on-chain momentum behind it? So it helps us establish a bit of a basis on whether this rally is sustainable or whether what we're actually looking for to see whether it uh, can really confirm in the on-chain space. And then we'll also look at network profitability. So particularly when we get a large move that's um, getting to the top end of a particular trading range. So we've been in this range for about two and a half months. There's been a fairly substantial amount of volume, a number of capitulations, and a huge amount of sell side pressure and buy side pressure to keep prices in that range. So what we can see when price gets to the top end of that is a bit of a gauge on how many coins were accumulated or have their cost basis in that particular range. It's showing us what the profitability of the network is, and helps us establish what kind of support or resistance actually exists within that particular block of pricing. So let's jump across to Glassnode Studio and we'll get started with the analysis. So if we start off looking at our dashboard, that we can see that we've got some green candles over the course of this week. So we've started to trade higher from the lows down around 29,000. And with the majority of exchanges peaking up around the $38,500 range. So there was a significant squeeze from the downside. Uh, this week has certainly been a positive one for price. And if we look particularly at the market structure when it comes to derivatives exchanges, it tells us a lot about what was going on, particularly over the last 24 hours, and potentially gives us things to pay attention to over the coming week. So if we look at things like our options open interest and our futures open interest on perpetual markets, we can see that over the last couple of days has been somewhat of a climb. We're starting to see more interest in the derivative space. We've had this fairly stable, but also a general uptrend in the amount of open interest. People are willing to take more leverage and more speculation coming into the market. If we zoom in on a six monthly basis, we can actually see that our funding rate, so this is telling us how far the, on aggregate, the spot pricing is trading differently to futures perpetual markets. So generally what we see is that when markets are very, very bullish, it will, the futures will trade at a premium. People are using leverage and trading above the spot pricing, and that provides an incentive for people to go short. And in general, when we have large periods of time when it, um, funding rates trade in one direction, it generally means a large proportion of the market is offside and builds that potential for some kind of squeeze. Now, what we've seen since the sell-off in May is an almost very or a very persistent period of negative funding rates. And that, again, is starting to suggest that even though we had this rally in price over the last couple of days, over the last week, what we saw is that funding rates continue to go negative. And ultimately, that then um, indicated that we had a squeeze to the upside. So the combination of rising open interest, the combination of perpetually negative funding rate, and a significant uh, rally in price essentially squeezed a lot of shorts out of their positions. And we can see that volume exploded on uh, on options relative to where it's been trading over the last couple of months, and options volume continues to trade higher, or open interest. And we also saw that we had around 120,000, uh, it's actually climbed since then, 220 million, sorry, uh, in short liquidations over that same period of time. So um, it does tell us that the, a driving force or a primary driver in that initial move was likely to be a leveraged short squeeze as traders got pushed out of their positions. And what we've also looked at in this week is a fairly interesting dynamic, and these are some new metrics that we've rolled out, uh, which is looking at the um, the rate of open interest that is cash margin. So by cash margin, that means it's using USD or some stablecoin type equivalent as the primary collateral for uh, for any futures positions that are open. 
Now, in a stable market, what we do want to see, so we've seen that there's been an increase in the number of cash margin futures. So the amount of collateral that's using USD backing or fiat backing in some equivalent form has been structurally climbing. And we've been seeing the converse where we see a reduction in crypto margin. So this is using other volatile assets as the collateral for the futures position. The dominance of that has fallen from somewhere around 70% down to about 52%. So what we're actually seeing is that overall, the market is certainly in a more risk off period where it prefers to be using cash margin rather than crypto margin. And overall, this is a fairly healthy sign for the entire market. Um, it removes that extra layer of volatility on top of margin uh, that is present in crypto margined uh, futures. So ideally, what we would like to see is this structural uptrend continue, suggesting that people are using more USD and fiat back collateral rather than crypto margin. But again, if we do start to see an uptick in more crypto margin, which we've actually seen over the last couple of days, then that can actually exacerbate volatility and potentially start driving squeezes and in either direction. So that's certainly something to be paying attention to. Now, if we also then look, so that's the market structure on the derivative side. So we've established that there was most likely a short squeeze that really pushed prices higher, um, which then obviously brings in more speculation and spot demand. What we're really not seeing is that translate into the on-chain transaction volume. So what we have here is our total transaction volume on an entity adjusted basis and on a total basis. So what the entity adjustment does is it will filter out for only economic transactions. It removes some of the wallet management and self spends and other things that, uh, that have heuristics of being non-economically important. And what it's trying to do is capture a more realistic view of the amount of transaction volume. But you can see across both of these metrics that it still is some distance off the highs. We're not really seeing a significant uptick in the amount of demand for block space and people moving large settlement volumes. And what this is being reflected in, we then have an equivalent network value to transaction ratio or NVT. And what this is mapping is the market cap divided by the amount of transaction volume. It's essentially the inverse of velocity. And what we want to see in a healthy market is lower values or a downtrend in the NVT ratio. So we saw that we had this through, the, uh, through Q1 and Q2 of 2021. We had a structural downtrend in the in the NVT. And what that's suggesting is that as market price was rallying, we were seeing an increase or a, a larger increase in the amount of transaction volume. So as prices rallied, we had more and more transaction volume that's starting to justify that they actually can sustain those prices. Now, what we've recently seen is a reversion back to the upside on both of these metrics. And what that's actually suggesting is that even though prices have now fallen, so as the market cap falls, that even if the transaction uh, volume stays the same, if market cap falls, it's bringing it back in line with that estimated valuation. The, the utility of the network comes back in line with the market cap. Now, what we're seeing with this rally higher is we're not seeing an uptick in transaction volume, but we are seeing an uptick in price. So the way to interpret this is that at the moment, what the NVT is telling us by rallying higher it's actually telling us that the transaction volume is not increasing at the same rate as market price. So when we're trading sideways on an NVT, it's essentially saying that at the current market cap, the transaction volume is stable. It's, it's suggesting that there's a justification or an equilibrium, let's call it. Now, so this break higher, what we don't necessarily want to see is that continue to go. We don't necessarily want to see prices continuing to rally and there being no demand for block space. Now, it's possible that that's some form of disbelief rally where the market hasn't quite caught on and perhaps it will follow on. But this is a very interesting dynamic where it's showing that there's not the same demand for block space as what's going on in the pricing market. So it does remain to be seen how these two dynamics play out, whether the on-chain volume will actually follow price and it needs to go through um, a period of, uh, of an uptrend to really confirm and build that confidence, or whether in fact there is a structural downtrend in the demand for block space and whether that's actually a leading indicator that the, uh, the market is, is going to respond to. So it's a very interesting dynamic where our on-chain activity is relatively quiet despite prices rallying higher. So it'll be very interesting to watch that dynamic as we move forward. Now, what we can also see, so now we've got our sending addresses, sending entities, and our receiving addresses and receiving entities. So the way to think about this is in general, sending entities um, in the majority of cases uh, for the Bitcoin network, particularly during these quieter periods, sending entities are more likely to be sending their coins to an exchange. It's generally UTXO destruction. It's generally people who are spending and otherwise selling their coins. 
Now, conversely, we make the opposite assumption for receiving addresses. What we want to see is more people withdrawing, taking self-custody, pulling coins out of exchanges, and being the recipients of those coins. Now, the use of entities is actually uh, a way that, so we can see here on the sending addresses and receiving addresses, our axes are between 800,000 and 400,000 on a daily basis. When we look at that in terms of entities, which distills down, and this, if the same entity happens to own the same addresses, we can see we're talking 200,000 to 75,000. So roughly of order about four times less, uh, four times fewer entities, which you could say that on average, each entity holds four addresses under that uh, heuristic model. Now, what we are seeing at the moment is that sending entities and sending addresses is relatively flat. Receiving addresses is also relatively flat, but the number of receiving entities is actually spiking higher. So if we then think about that from what that means, it means that this, a stable number of people are essentially sending their coins and we can make an assumption or a guesstimate that some of those are gonna be sending to an exchange for sale. But an increasing number of them are there's new entities coming in on chain. Now these could be new buyers, they could be people who are doing a dollar cost average and withdrawing to a, a unique address which can't be tied to the same entity. It's showing that there's more people receiving those coins than are spending them. And we can actually see on the ratio here, um, we're looking at a value of uh, 230,000 um, in terms of receiving entities. And in terms of sending entities, we're looking at somewhere around 100,000. So there is a difference there in terms of just the magnitude of how many are sending and receiving. Um, so this is one thing to just be paying attention to. It is good to see on that front, but again, it would be nice to be supported by an increase in overall transfer volume. So really we're looking for that combination of effects to really build that confidence that people are finding utility and using the network and, uh, and finding value in it. And finally, what we're gonna look at is network profitability. So um, we're gonna start with the realized price, uh, which is a derivative of the realized cap. Now the realized cap or the realized price is the on-chain equivalent to market cap and spot price. And what the realized price is, it's one of these fundamental metrics that underpins a great deal of on-chain analysis. So what the realized price does is for every coin or every UTXO on the network, it looks at the price when that UTXO was created or in other words, when that coin last moved. So what was the price when that coin moved? And then we can establish and we can estimate that that is the cost basis or essentially the cost of acquisition for all of the coins. So if we then look at that on an entire market basis, what we can do is establish what the aggregate cost basis is. If we look at every single coin and price it at the time when it last moved, that's our, our assumed cost basis for the aggregate network. So what we can also look at is what happens when price rallies away or to that realized price. What does that tell us about the profitability of the network? How far away is price trading from that aggregate cost basis? Now, if we look at our total supply in profit, so during this rally, as we've gone from 29,000 up to 38,500, what we've seen is that roughly 11.2% of the entire BTC supply has gone from underwater to in profit, some 2.1 million coins. So what that's telling us is that between the consolidation period that we've seen over the last two and a half months, and the equivalent transactions that were going on back in January and February 2021, there is at least 11.2% of the global supply that has a cost basis between 29,000 and 38 and a half. So it's showing us how much of the coin supply has a cost basis in that zone. Now, what we can also look at is our MVRV ratio. So this is taking the ratio between our market cap and our realized cap, or our market price and our realized price, and it's showing us how much profitability is in the network. And we can look at these various fractals and particularly over the historical timeframes to understand whereabouts we are in the market cycle. Now we have two metrics here. One is our standard MVRV ratio and the other is our short-term holder MVRV ratio. Now, both of these metrics are actually in a very depressed state, particularly on the short-term holder MVRV. Um, what we're seeing is that in general, a very large portion of the network is underwater. So on the short-term holders, we can see that our value is down here about 0.75. Um, it's rallied a little bit higher over the last couple of days, but what that's telling us, because it's at below a value of one, the market of short-term holders is on net underwater by about 25 to 20%. That's what this, uh, this metric trading down here is telling us. Now, in a historical basis, we can see that this is actually quite low. I mean, it's comparative to our March 2020 sell-off. And it's showing a point when the maximum cross-section of people are actually holding underwater coins. It's a sign of capitulation, and it's generally a sign of a macro reversal. 
On, likewise, on our standard MVRV, we tend to see values like this in one of three scenarios. The first one is as we enter a bear market and that first phase of market participants are still holding onto their coins. And as we move into that bearish trend, people start to realize perhaps we're actually going to start trending into a, uh, a more sustained downtrend. So it's that mid cycle, people are just realizing that we're moving into that bearish trend. There's another point when we're coming back out of a bear market and we're starting that early bullish phase. So it's in that pre-bull phase. And the third one, which has only happened once in Bitcoin's history, is actually the 2013 peak. So in that first uh, maneuver that we saw, that first rally, uh, we then saw a fairly dramatic decline. And that was the same point when we actually saw the MVRV reverse again. So what we're seeing is the current position for both the MVRV and the short-term holder MVRV are both in positions that are historically uncommon and generally precede some kind of volatility. Now, on the standard MVRV, that can be both to the upside or the downside. On the short-term holder MVRV, generally that signal appears only in bearish markets. But remember that will also occur at the end of a bear market, for example, March 2020, which then reverses back into a bull trend. So in either case, this really confirms what we're seeing in a lot of the derivatives markets and the options pricing that's showing that volatility is expected and it could go in either direction. That's really what the market is saying at the moment. And it's fairly coincident across multiple different metrics. There is confluence both in the on-chain space and across derivative space. And finally, for the last metric that I'm certainly paying attention to, um, particularly if we get a rally or a sell-off, so in either direction, if we get any volatility in either, in either direction, what I'm really looking at is the spent output age bands, because what is quite important is, are people actually selling into that market strength or in panic? And in particular, what I'm looking at is these warmer colors down the bottom here, these, these purples and these reds, that's really telling us, are we seeing older coins coming back to life? So should we get a relief rally that trades higher? Are we seeing that the market of older hands are actually spending into that, taking that exit liquidity? Conversely, do we see an actual sell-off where they start to exit out of that because of their lost conviction? And finally, if we do see some kind of rally or major sell-off and the proportion of these warmer colors actually remains very low, which suggests that older hands are not spending their coins, then that would actually suggest that there is a higher level of conviction, even though there's volatility, even though the market is rallying or selling off to a great extent, it's showing that those older hands are actually not taking that opportunity to sell into the exit liquidity. So it's showing that there is that conviction that remains in those long-term holders and in that smart money cohort. So thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope this was valuable in uh, getting an overview of what's going on in the current market structure. And I look forward to seeing you in the next week. Cheers.